Welcome back, my friends. This is Dr. Me with the Actuarial Academy, and I'd like to work a fairly complex and tedious actuarial probability type problem for you, and it involves finding the density of the ratio of two independent random variables. Now, you'll most certainly find this problem on the actuarial exam and I'm just going to offer you a very general version of it to where it can be applied to any problem involving finding the density of the ratio of two random variables. We'll begin with two densities. Random variable x distributed as a, an exponential random variable with rate 1 and another random variable y with rate 1 half. So this is an exponential random variable, this top one x with mean 1, and this random variable here, y, has mean 2. And we'd like to find the density of the ratio of x to y, which we'll call z, where y, x and y are independent. So at first sight, it seems rather difficult in the sense that well, you may want to think about uh, using the Jacobians because they're involving two random variables or some sort of a bizarre transformation. Well, in a case like this, actually there's a clever or quick way, well, I won't say quick, but there's a relatively simple way to actually find the density of the ratio of two random variables. But before we go there, I'll we'll talk about fact one. And this is something you most certainly should know. So if you have two random variables, given their respective densities here, then if they're independent, then you can actually just find the joint density very simply by just multiplying the two densities. Okay, so you can just multiply these two to get your joint density function. And so another fact, which is not really a fact, it's just a trick. It's something that you you may not realize to do immediately, and then after you see how to do it, you're, you, you, you think, oh, I should have thought of that. And it's the probability of x divided by y is less than or equal to z, where z is a you know, fixed fixed variable is just equal to probability x is less than or equal to z times y. Okay, so this is the little trick that we're going to use for this problem here in that if by algebra, by very simple algebra, we convert this to this and now we can use basic calculus to compute this and and so our cumulative distribution function um, which is actually here, I guess I can write that in here, big F of Z, okay, is actually equal to that. Should have squeezed that in earlier. Okay, so our cumulative distribution function can be written as this. And so then when we actually try to find the density of Z, then we just take the derivative of this. Actually, there is one other fact I'd like to mention that is a very, very common integral, and the integral is the following. If you'd like to integrate, so we'll call this actually, uh, let's say fact 3, the integral of e to the mx dx is equal to 1 over m times e to the e to the mx power plus c, of course. To be technically correct, we won't worry about that when solving these problems, though. And this is, of course, true for m not equal to 0. And so we'll actually employ this fact when working out this problem. <coughs> so, continuing on here, we we start again from from here. Our f of z is equal to, and I'm just going to rewrite this here, probability, just for completeness, x divided by y is less than or equal to z, is again equal to probability that x is less than or equal to z times y, which is going to end up being an integral actually a double integral because we have two two variables here and we're trying to find the region where x divided by y is less than or equal to some say fixed constant or fixed variable you can think of it as a fixed constant z and so uh, well I should draw out the region here a moment and, and see what that looks like of the the product since x and y were independent we can just take the product of both of these here and we we end up with e to the negative x times one half. Okay, and we're going to actually integrate dx dy. 
So now we need to find our limits of integration. Well, the outside limit of integration is going to go from from 0 to infinity. Okay, we're talking about a an exponential random variable, so y only lives on 0 to infinity. Okay, 0 everywhere else. And now we need to determine what these limits are inside. So, let me draw a graph here so we can think of this as x and this is y and this line is going to be x is equal to z times y and the reason is is because we're just trying to find where this inequality actually becomes inequality and that'll cre actually create our boundary for our region of integration and so we need to determine if this side here is where x is less than or equal to zy or this side here well we, we can just take a point say point at 0 1 okay take the point 0 1 here that coordinate x is 0 y is 1 okay for z positive of course this we're doing this for z non negative uh, this would actually satisfy this inequality so we need to find the volume underneath this function bounded by this region here that'll help us find the limits of integration and I always like to could kinda draw something thicker here so as y changes from 0 to to infinity we need to figure out how x is going to change or x is going to wiggle okay so x is going to actually take on some values here and it's clearly going to start at 0 so that's pretty easily understood starts at 0 there but the question is how far does it go up well for any given fixed y as we're integrating here it's going to go to z times y because that's where it actually stops. That's where it's equal. So this actually goes up to z times y. So when x is 0, it integrates up to 0. But when, say, y is 1, like right here, then z x will go from 0 to z. Okay, and so forth. And that's how x moves. So these are your limits of integration there. So then we can just continue on solving this double integral. And now it just becomes a calculus problem 0 to infinity of negative e to the negative x because we're integrating x first dx here so this is essentially a constant which we could pull out front but I'm just going to leave it right here the reason why the integral of e to the negative x is negative e to the negative x is because negative 1 represents m here so we have the integral of e to the negative 1 times x so it's equal to 1 divided by negative 1 here, so that's how you get the negative 1, and you still have the e to the negative x. And we're going to evaluate that from 0 to z times y, and we still have our dy here. Let's see if I can squeeze that in here, moving on. That's then equal to the integral from 0 to infinity, and we're going to substitute zy in for x here, and that will just be negative e to the negative zy, minus a minus, so it becomes plus, divided with 0, this just becomes a 1, and let's put parentheses around that, times 1 half e to the negative y over 2 dy. I'm going to have to turn the page here, is equal to, I'm just going to combine that integrand, and if you do that, you actually end up with negative 1 half, convince yourself of this, I might be skipping some algebra here, negative y z plus 1 half plus one half e to the negative y divided by two and we're still integrating this from zero to infinity and this is still dy so this whole entire term here is what we need to integrate so it looks pretty intimidating at first but we're gonna apply our rule that we saw over here again integral of e to the mx where m is a constant is equal to one over m e to the mx and our m here is actually equal to z plus one half because that's really the constant Z is not a variable here, so when you apply that and you make sure you get the algebra right, these problems can be pretty tedious, you end up with 1 half times 1 divided by Z plus 1 half, so I literally applied the rule, literally took 1 over that and put it here, of course the negative comes along with that, but the negative cancels out with that one, the 1 half still stays, E to the negative Y times Z plus 1 half, okay, like that, and then we still take the integral here, applying the same rule, our M here is negative 1 half, if you divide that here 1 over m, the 1 halves cancel, so you're just left with e to the negative y over 2, all evaluated from 0 to infinity, this entire expression. So I'm going step by step through because this one is a little bit tedious, 
if you evaluate this at infinity, you're going to see that this goes to zero. This is just a constant here, so e to the negative y. This actually goes to zero, so that annihilates that. And this also goes to zero. So anything for infinity, it goes to zero. So if you want to make that really, really clear, you, you literally have zero minus zero minus whatever you get when you plug in zero. Okay, if you plug in zero here, then this just becomes one, and you're left with one over two one half times the same quantity, and then minus one for here when you plug in zero. So you have to make sure you keep track of all this. Okay, again, you have to be so careful because you still have this negative here, so this ends up becoming one minus this quantity here. I always like to work these out very carefully to make sure not try to be too much of a hero in terms of algebra gymnastics just make sure you do your housekeeping okay like that which is then equal to and you can use algebra to show that this is equal to 2z divided by 2z plus 1 okay you may think whoa finally I got the answer and it's possible they may even have this answer as one to be selected which would really be sneaky on their part because you have to remember they asked for the density this is the cumulative distribution function of z they had to ask for that you'd be done but unfortunately they didn't okay so you have to get you have to do one more step and I'll do that over here if you want to actually find the the density function of z we know that that that, that is actually equal to the derivative of our cumulative distribution function which is equal to just the derivative of this what we just found 2z divided by 2z plus 1 which is equal to now again I guess I could have included this in fact but I don't want to make this too much of a calculus tutorial, but when you're doing the derivative of a ratio, it's it's I always like to remember the the phrase low d high minus high d low over low low. So low is two z plus one. Low d high high so that's in terms of derivative in terms of z, so we're left with two. It's low d high minus high d low, and d low is just two, all divided by low low. I know it sounds silly, but all my life I've always memorized the derivative of the ratio that way. Low, low meaning low squared, which is then just equal to, after the smoke clears, you get your final answer is z divided by 2z plus 1 squared. And that is our density function of the ratio of the independent random variables x and y. Thank you.